Chapter 15 Kitty I can't believe he's here, whispered a horrified Kitty as she came to a complete stop, causing Holly to accidentally bump into her. They were returning from the ladies' room to join everyone for dinner when Kitty spotted someone in the dining area before the Ramsley's private dining room. Who? Holly whispered back, grabbing Kitty's shoulder to keep her balance. My ex-boyfriend, murmured Kitty. Her stomach bottomed out as Tristan got out of his chair at the dining table, going on one knee and opening a ring box. The woman he was proposing to pressed her hands to her mouth in surprise. Oh, dear, breathed Holly. Maybe we should walk away. No, Kitty evaluated her feelings as the woman nodded, smiling ear to ear as Tristan slipped the ring onto her finger. I want to see this. It could have been her. No, it would never have been her, Kitty corrected herself. Tristan had no intention of proposing to her. He had strung her along for six years without any intentions. Kitty had let him. Her friends were right. He didn't love her. Did she love him? Kitty had told herself so many times over the relationship that she did, almost like a mantra, willing it to be true. If that was the case, then she probably didn't love him. Tristan and the mystery woman kissed, all happiness and bliss. People nearby politely applauded the couple. Kitty felt relief. It was truly over now. Was that normal? To be relieved when someone else moved on? If that was the case, had she loved him at all? I really think we should go, murmured Holly, taking Kitty by the arm. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Kitty let Holly lead her to the bar. You're a psychiatrist, right? Yes, concurred Holly as she carefully sat on a bar stool, careful of her dress. Kitty perched on the stool beside her. Why am I so dumb? I wasted six years on him. I gave him every opportunity to pick me. I ignored the signs he was cheating on me. I made up every excuse to my friends to allow for his behavior. What is wrong with me? How long ago did you break up with him? Questioned Holly. She smiled at the bartender. Something fruity. Surprise me. He broke up with me a little over three weeks ago, admitted Kitty. He even asked me if I thought she would like the ring. Oh, dear, grimaced Holly. Get my friend here something, too. My girlfriends kept telling me he wasn't right for me, moaned Kitty. I just don't know why I didn't see it before. Holly cocked her head to the side as she looked at Kitty. What is an irritating habit that he has, besides the cheating? He picks his teeth after every meal with a toothpick, shuddered Kitty. Even snacks. Who does that? One year I got him toothpicks for Christmas as a joke. He sincerely appreciated it. Good. Now every time you see him, I want you to think toothpicks, advised Holly. Just toothpicks. You will never go back to him. It's that easy? A doubtful kitty said. Not really. It's a mind trick, clarified Holly. The idea is to give your rational mind a moment to think of all the other reasons you should not be with this person should they ever ask you again, and associate those reasons with the toothpick habit. You will learn to loathe toothpicks altogether. It usually works. He's getting married. I don't think he's going to ask me to be his girlfriend again, remarked Kitty. Holly had a laugh. That spoiled man-boy over there is going to find out marriage isn't as easy as he's been led to believe. When he starts hitting those first bumps in the matrimonial road, he's going to look for someone familiar who soothes his ego. He will come running back to you, asking you to be his girl, promising he will leave his wife for you and find every excuse in the book not to. He will groom you to be the other woman. He's been doing that all along, from the sounds of it. I've seen his kind many times. That was blunt, blinked Kitty. She took a delicate cocktail straw and sipped the drink the bartender put down in front of her. I'm being your friend, not your psychiatrist, dryly spoke Holly. If I were your doctor, I would have to lead you gently and politely through the whole process, while charging you hundreds of dollars an hour. I'll take the friendship over the bill, thank you, noted Kitty. I thought you would, smiled Holly. Now your mother and father, what's up with them? 
They divorced when I was around eight, shrugged Kitty. He had some other girl knocked up who was half his age. There it is, declared Holly. Subconsciously, you blame your mom for not keeping your dad happy so he would stay in your family unit. I don't even like my dad, frowned Kitty. I mean, maybe he would have stayed and been a better person if she had not. Oh my word, you're totally right. I have been blaming mom. Which is why you're willing to do anything to keep a relationship going, even if it means you are the proverbial doormat, concluded Holly. She flagged down the bartender. Another round, please. Kitty realized her drink was empty. How do I fix it? You realize you are just as important as the other person in the relationship, and your needs should be met as well, commented Holly. Something which is super easy to say, but hard to do. Especially after you've already gotten yourself into the habit of giving and not receiving. Kitty sighed dejectedly. Am I doomed to repeat the mistake? I mean, now I'm out of the relationship, I can see the whole thing was just wrong. Yet when he lavished me with attention, I would get sucked back in. Hence the thinking about toothpicks so you won't get sucked back in. Holly thought about Kitty's question as she munched on a pretzel stick from a bowl. What you need is a person who will put you first. A kind, nice guy who has the same relationship issues you do. Then both of you can spend your lives trying to make each other happy. My friend Maya thinks I should date Ben, laughed Kitty. Why not? questioned a curious Holly. Ben is a classic case of a man who would literally do anything for the woman in his life. He is solid relationship material. The only risk is that he'll find someone who will abuse that good quality. We're just friends, sobered Kitty. There isn't any spark. You have thought about him, a satisfied Holly took another sip from her straw. Do tell. Kitty shrugged with forced nonchalance. I did a little experiment, to see if Ben might be interested in me. I gave him every opportunity to make a move, and he didn't. Ben isn't a player. He doesn't make moves, gently chided Holly. I talked to him, and he was very nice, polite, and shy. His family overshadows him. Ben is used to letting other people make the moves in his personal life. He is passive. Kitty frowned. Ben isn't shy. Maybe not in business or around his friends, allowed Holly. What did you do for your experiment? I asked him to do up the back of my dress, admitted Kitty. Most guys would get at least a little frisky doing up the zipper when it's a strapless. Plus, we slow danced afterward. How did he make you feel? pressed Holly. Safe, comfortable, sighed Kitty. Like he always does. Hmm. Holly munched on another pretzel. How did you want him to make you feel? I don't know, muttered Kitty as she stirred her drink. Excited, nervous, the whole butterflies in the abdomen thing? The way Tristan makes you feel, said a knowing Holly. Well, yeah, shrugged Kitty. Ben isn't Tristan, Holly pointed out. He won't make you feel the same way, which is probably a good thing. Kitty had a sigh thinking over the many differences between the two men. Have the two of you ever kissed? wondered Holly. No. If we did, it could ruin the whole relationship, explained Kitty. I value Ben as my friend. The last thing I want is to hurt him. A kiss is a surefire indicator of if there'll be any spark or not, murmured Holly. Have you thought of him and you in bed together? What, like sex? Kitty blushed red. No! Why not? asked Holly with a grin. Believe me, I have often thought about my boyfriend and I in that situation, almost to the point where I'm ready to tell him to forget my five-year plan and get married early. You and your boyfriend aren't... Kitty trailed off. Nope. Holly released a pent-up breath. Molson and I have enjoyed a lot together, but we haven't yet had sex. He has this idea we should be at least engaged first. It's funny, because I think everyone would never guess how old-fashioned he really is. I adored it at the beginning of the relationship. Now I'm frustrated to the point of being ready to seduce him. Your boyfriend is the doctor with the tattoos, clarified Kitty. Holly nodded. Yet we're not talking about me. We are supposed to be talking about you. 
you need to kiss Ben and do a little imagining before you decide to set him aside as no spark. Even without spark, people can have great relationships if they both have the same goals. Why would anyone want to be married without any chemistry? frowned Kitty. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Holly finished her drink. Twenty-four? Kitty gave Holly a suspicious look. Don't tell me I'm too young to understand. Just kiss the guy, advised Holly. You'll probably knock his socks off. Hopefully, he'll knock your socks off, too. If not, then just blame it on the booze. Are you used to drinking this much? Kitty eyed Holly. No, I was kind of keeping pace with you. Holly frowned. I'm probably going to regret it. Kitty laughed. Maybe we should find your boyfriend. Or at least other women in the Ramsley group. Holly turned to view the crowd. She was surprised as she watched Molson come towards them. Speaking of him, he's right here. You say you're looking for me? drawled the tattooed doctor as he leaned on the bar beside Holly. Molson, meet Kitty. Holly introduced them. Kitty came with Ben. Nice to meet you, nodded Molson before he looked at the three empty glasses in front of Holly. You drink all those? I must have. Holly looked at the empty glasses in slight awe. I may have been a bad influence, noted Kitty. We were talking about relationships. Heavy stuff, agreed Molson with a nod. I think we should revisit the five-year plan and move up the timeline, Holly told him, putting a hand on his arm. If sober you agrees, then we can discuss it, grinned Molson. I'm not drunk, an indignant Holly said. Three beverages, Molson pointed at the empties. We drank through straws, warned Kitty. I'm pretty sure it's kicking in for her. She isn't a drinker, is she? Nope confirmed Molson as he grabbed a pretzel from the bowl, munching on it. She is usually full-on sober. Holly leaned forward, whispering something in his ear, which caused Molson to choke on the dry pretzel. He coughed badly, and Kitty offered him her drink. He swallowed with a grimace, asking hoarsely, What is this? Kitty shrugged. Something the bartender gave us? How about it? sweetly asked Holly. I think your dad would skin me alive, wheezed Molson. He handed Kitty back her drink. Drew is going to be one unhappy man tonight. Why, frowned Holly. Why would your brother be unhappy? I'm giving you to Bethany until the buzz wears off, Molson decided. A man has only so much willpower. You're being a spoil sport, judged Holly. She ran a hand down his arm. Okay, nice to meet you, Kitty, said Molson as he helped Holly stand. It's time to find my soon-to-be sister-in-law to take care of my girlfriend. Kitty ordered one last drink, watching the crowd. She thought of Molson and Holly, who obviously had chemistry. Molson also respected his girlfriend. Any other guy would probably just have taken Holly up to the hotel room. Kitty frowned. Molson was a gentleman. So was Ben. Maybe that was why she had not gotten a reaction. Not because Ben wasn't interested, but because he had been raised to be respectful and not go over certain boundaries. Maybe all the Ramsleys were gentlemen. Sipping her drink, Kitty thought over what Holly had said. Ben was a husky guy. He made Kitty feel tiny in comparison. Yet he wasn't exactly fat. He had lost weight. Kitty had meant what she said about him looking sharp in his suit. Ben was a handsome man. She closed her eyes and let her imagination run for a moment. Her breath caught in her throat as she thought about, Hey, would you like another drink? The bartender asked. Kitty flushed red and blinked in embarrassment. She put her empty drink on the bar. No, thank you. She showed him her room key so he could put the tab on the room's bill. Getting up from the stool, she waited until the room righted itself. Okay, four drinks through a straw had not been a great idea. Leaving the restaurant, she went for the elevator. Tapping the button, Kitty waited for it to arrive. Kitty, a voice said in surprise. Kitty glanced over to see Tristan beside her, waiting for the elevator as well. 
toothpicks, she reminded herself. How have you been? asked Tristan. I wasn't expecting you to be here. I'm here for a wedding. Kitty pressed the button to call the elevator again. Mercifully, the doors opened. He followed her onto the elevator. Drat. You know, I feel bad about the way things were left between us, began Tristan, eyeing her. Kitty didn't feel bad. Finally, she felt free. It was an interesting experience. Kitty loved it. Seeing Tristan propose had been like the last piece of the puzzle to shed her previous attachment to him. She hit the button for her floor number and hoped he would leave her alone if she ignored him. You mean a lot to me. Tristan pressed another button, deliberately crowding her. We should have said a proper goodbye. We still can if you'd like. I could come to your room. Kitty gaped at him as the elevator started to move. You just proposed two minutes ago to your fiancé, and now you're trying to get sex out of me? Hey, we were good together, smiled Tristan, as he put an arm on the wall of the elevator, effectively blocking her in the corner. He pushed a strand of hair out of her face. We can be good one last time. No, stated Kitty in a firm voice. You have a fiancé. I also have a hotel maid who is willing to do a menage a trois. If you're up for it, he murmured. You're a slime ball, gasped Kitty. Heedless, the elevator had come to a stop and the doors were open. The biggest, slimiest slime ball there ever was. You're so slimy, this elevator cannot hold all your slime. You're disgusting. Is that a no? wondered Tristan, a little confused. Absolutely no, exclaimed Kitty. She ducked underneath his arm, escaping the elevator. Come on, complained Tristan as he followed her. Don't be mad. My parents are making me marry her. I've always loved you, Kitty. You know I would marry you in a heartbeat, but I cannot go against my parents. They would cut me off without a dime. It's their fault we cannot be together. Toothpicks, growled Kitty as she continued down the hallway. What? A confused Tristan asked. I don't understand. You don't need to understand, muttered Kitty. She came to Ben's room and knocked on the door. Kitty hoped he was there. If she went to her own room and Tristan followed her in, she couldn't be responsible for what she did to him. Go away. Hey, is that any way to talk to the love of your life? Surely you're not still mad, are you? Tristan questioned. Listen, I regret breaking up with you. I thought it would be the right thing to do with having to propose. Maybe we don't have to be apart. Are you asking me to be your mistress? Aghast, Kitty wondered. Three weeks ago, she might have thought about the offer. She might have fallen for the idea of keeping him, and hoping he would eventually choose her instead. Had she really been so dumb? Kitty could hear the door open behind her. Is it really so bad of an idea? responded Tristan. We could still be together, and my parents would still give me the money. All we have to do is wait for them to die so I can divorce my wife, then you and I can get married. The stuff that comes out of your mouth, muttered Ben in the doorway of the hotel room. How had she been so desperate as to put up with this guy? Kitty looked at her former boyfriend in amazement. Think about it, Kitty, insisted Tristan. You know you want me. Okay, I'm interfering. Ben took Kitty by the arm, pulling her into the room. Goodbye, Tristan. He shut the door, locking it, before looking at Kitty. Please tell me you're not tempted to go back to him. Kitty shuddered, remembering how blasé Tristan had been about having a threesome. No. You have to know he isn't any good for you, insisted Ben. You deserve better than him, Kit. Please, don't go back to him. I'm not going back to him, responded Kitty. She wasn't. She finally had her eyes wide open in regards to Tristan for once. Too bad it hadn't happened years sooner. He's a piece of trash, continued Ben. What he just said about waiting for his parents to die? They're not that old. He doesn't really care about you. If he did, he wouldn't be offering to make you his mistress. I know, 
Kitty felt like Ben wasn't really listening to her. For some reason, you keep going back to him. It has to stop, said Ben. He really needed to stop talking about Tristan, decided Kitty. Maybe it was the drinks which gave her an extra boost of courage. Maybe it was the pep talk Holly had given her. Either way, it was time to see once and for all if there was any spark. Kitty turned her back to Ben. Undo me, please. Are you avoiding talking about this? questioned Ben as he automatically unhooked, then unzipped the dress. I'm not avoiding anything. You talked, and I agreed with you. Kitty dropped the dress, heading to Ben's dresser to grab one of his t-shirts. Taking off her heels, she put the tee on. It was so much more comfortable than the corseted dress she had been wearing. She turned back to Ben. He was red and staring at the ceiling. She had bikinis with the same amount of material as the bra and undies she was wearing. He had seen her in them when they had gone to the beach with their friends. It wasn't that shocking. Kitty eyed him. Sit on the bed. Excuse me? Ben let himself have a quick look at her, noting she was covered. You're too tall, complained Kitty. Sit. I'm not sure you agreed with me, mentioned Ben as he sat on the edge of the bed. What are you going to do tomorrow when you have had time to think about Tristan's offer? You have a bad habit of going back to him. I'm not going back to him, Kitty assured Ben. Tristan has toothpicks. Ben frowned. Have you been drinking? Only a little, confessed Kitty. Holly helped me. I see, said Ben, looking confused. She gave me some really great advice, mentioned Kitty, putting her hands on his shoulders. Holly is so smart. I think you've had more than just a little to drink, concluded Ben with a frown. Doesn't matter, a confident Kitty replied. I want to see if you have spark. Spark? echoed a puzzled Ben. All it takes is one spark to light a forest fire, murmured Kitty. She threaded her hands through his hair, leaning down and placing her lips on his. Ben didn't respond at first. For a moment, Kitty wondered if he was going to. Just as she was about to start feeling a little silly for kissing him, he kissed her back. It was enough to make her weak in the knees. This was more than a spark. She suspected if they continued long enough, there could be an inferno. That was about the moment rational thought left her fuzzy brain. She didn't know how long they kissed. Suddenly, Ben was standing up, pulling her hands away from him. You should, um... Ben cleared his throat. You should have some water and sleep off the alcohol. Confusion swamped Kitty. Didn't he feel the spark? Her entire body was on fire. Come on. Ben took her by the hand, leading her to the kitchenette. He filled up a glass of water, handing it to her. Drink up and then bed for you. Kitty took the glass, thinking over the past few minutes as she drank the water. Surely he had felt the spark. Unless he didn't. Had she ruined a perfectly good friendship? Kitty couldn't imagine not being friends with Ben. He was such a large piece of her life. Ben took the glass from her, setting it down. He went to the bed, turning down the covers as Kitty trailed in his wake. Ben, whispered Kitty. Yeah? Ben straightened to look down at her. Kitty swallowed over the lump in her throat. We're still friends, right? We are always friends, he assured her. Somehow, the words both relieved her and made her miserable. She crawled into the bed and let Ben tuck her in like she was an errant child. Perhaps she was, Kitty ruefully reflected. If you enjoyed this chapter of The Wedding, Book 10 of the Ramsley Book series, please consider sharing with your friends so that they can enjoy it as well. Thank you and happy listening!